Hello everyone and welcome to Journey Online. There are people joining us right now from all across the US and from around the world. So wherever you are tuning in from, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Today is Mother's Day, so big shout out to all our moms. Happy Mother's Day to you. May your day be blessed and full of family, friends, and happiness. We would love to send all of our online moms a special gift from Journey Christian Church. If you would like to receive a Mother's Day gift, simply go to the link on the screen or wait for it to be posted in the online chat. This is our way of simply saying Happy Mother's Day and thank you for being a part of our online worship. Also, why not take a moment right now to invite a friend to join you online? They will be blessed as Pastor John Hampton continues our teaching series, Defining Moments. As always, we'll be celebrating communion together later in the service, and we would love for you to participate. So be sure to have some juice and bread nearby. Again, thanks for joining us today.
Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God again. God just with a, a heart of thanksgiving and gratefulness right now that he fights our battles for us that he wants to do that he literally loves us so much and he is overqualified for that position to fight our battles for us so right now I just encourage you to surrender anything you might need to to him right now right here at the top of the service but right now I want to wish all our moms a happy Mother's Day can we give it up for our moms yeah happy Mother's Day Oh man, I hope you moms feel honored today. I hope this is just the beginning, but that this whole day you are honored and uh, we love you. We love you so much. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> this is my wife, mother, mother of our children. <laughs> so yes, 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 absolutely. No, that's awesome, that's awesome. Well, if you're new to Journey, I wanna say a special welcome to you and uh, online and in the room, if you're new, you can follow the link on the screen and it's just a really good way to get connected initially. So follow that link and fill out the, the information there and uh, we'll have some people here get in touch with you and that's just a great way. We also do, if you're in person, have a, a tent set up right outside at the end of the service. You can go by there and uh, we'll talk about a gift we have for moms, uh, but we also have gift for those of you that are new. So drop by there later on today. Uh, but right now we're gonna continue on in our service and continue on in worship. And I just invite you to continue lifting up Jesus and, and proclaiming the goodness of our God together right now in song. Let's worship.
God, we thank you. Father, you are so good. Thank you for the victory that we have in you, God. Thank you for this time of worship together, God. God, I pray that we open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us over these next few moments. God, speak to us. Speak to us clearly. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. It's no secret that generosity has long been acknowledged as a way to increase happiness and improve emotional well-being. You could say generosity heals because it improves mental health, increases emotional health, and research shows generosity contributes to physical health. In fact, modern research confirms these ancient words of wisdom from Solomon. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And so whether it's volunteering your time or offering financial support, if it's from your heart, it heals your heart. There are a few ways you can express generosity for the things of God at Journey. You can give online through the Journey app, mail your gift to the church office, or if worshiping in person at one of our campuses, you can place your offering in one of the many offering stations throughout the building. Thank you for your generosity, and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace and your love. We pray for these gifts that are given to you. May you use them to multiply and grow your kingdom in ways we can only begin to imagine. Thank you so much for your love and grace again. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. journey. Good morning. Welcome to everyone at Apopka. We're so glad to have you with us today. Maybe it's your first time. Maybe it's your first time back in a long time. We're really glad to have you with us today. Let's welcome our Lake County campus. So good to have Lake County with us today. We welcome those folks at Lake County and our online community. So many watching from so many places. Yeah, let's clap for our online as well. Because I'm going to tell you something. Next week, Next week, you're going to hear a story about what God's doing in our online community. It's just going to blow you away. So we're excited about, uh, about that as well. Hey, happy Mother's Day to all moms. Let's give our moms a hand today. Happy Mother's Day. That's awesome. 
We have a special gift for you, Mom. It's in a uh, special wrapper that looks like this. And I love what this says on it. This gift has been prayed over by a group of women asking God to pour blessings over each mother who owns one. Love that little phrase. That's cool. Inside, it is a, uh, a little framed statement by a pastor named Andy Stanley, uh, one of the influential pastors in America. But uh, Pastor Stanley made a statement several years ago that we just kind of adopted as well. And it says this to moms and to dads, but for today for moms, your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. Amen. Someone that you raise. So this is a, it's a gift for all moms. You can pick it up outside here at Apopka, uh, just outside of our uh, auditorium. Well, last week we started a new series of messages called Defining Moments. Studies suggest that only 3% of life events would be considered highly memorable. The other 97% of life just sort of fades into a black hole called the subconscious. But the 3% that do make it are the moments that define us, that direct us, and that distinguish us as individuals. And becoming a mom is certainly one of those defining moments in life. And so today, we're going to look at some of the great and not so great mom moments of the best known and most misunderstood mother in the Bible, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Many people simply don't know what to make of Mary's role in the gospel story. In some versions of faith, she has been venerated in shrines, prayed to, worshipped even. Botticelli, da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, Bellini, and thousands of artists have imagined her on canvas. A number of legends have developed over the years about Mary. For instance, there are some who suggest that she remained a virgin all of her life. But the gospel writer Matthew clearly states in his gospel narrative that Jesus had brothers and sisters, implying obviously that Mary had children by Joseph. Some say Mary did not die, but ascended into heaven in the same manner that Jesus did, and that now she is the mediator in prayer between us and God. But that would contradict what Paul wrote to Timothy, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Mary was not sinless. She needed the child she delivered in birth to deliver her in new birth, just like we all do. And since Mary has occasionally been elevated to an exalted position not found in the scriptures, there's been a tendency for some in the church to go to the opposite extreme and say little or nothing about her. She's merely a necessary human means to a divine end who's rarely talked about other than at Christmas. The dominant non-Catholic view of Mary is that of a young woman who played the noble and necessary role of giving birth to Jesus. She's often most represented as mature beyond her years, quiet and compliant. She does her duty alongside Joseph and then fades to the background. But here's what I think. I think when we see Mary in light of who she really was, she was a favored yet flawed mom who, like every other mom, had some great moments and some not so great moments as a mother. And when we see her in that light, I think she can be a great source of comfort, encouragement, and hope for all moms in their parenting journey. And it all started with a startling announcement of an angel that Mary was favored and chosen by God to give birth to his son. Now, we all know that that turned out to be a great moment, but at first it was a deeply disturbing moment to Mary. The scripture says Mary was greatly troubled at his words, the angel's words, and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. Mary was greatly troubled because she understood that if what this angel was telling her was really going to happen to her, she was about to become highly unfavored in the eyes of many. A betrothed teenage girl who was pregnant before her wedding was not exactly a woman who found great favor in her devoutly religious community. Whispers of scandal and scorn 
would surely ensue. And yet in spite of her fear and questions, Mary nods her head in consent and says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Perhaps that is precisely why Mary was favored. She displayed a remarkable spirit of surrender to a calling that she did not and could not possibly understand in this moment. Mary's yes was not muffled consent that led her to a joyful pregnancy filled with supportive friends and sweet baby showers. Her life instantly became a cascade of gossip and drama, and her very decision to say yes was met with the threat of potentially immediate danger. A woman found pregnant before the wedding was assumed to be an adulteress, the penalty of which at the time was death by stoning. And yet, in spite of the danger and fears and ridicule, she still said yes to the unexpected interruption that motherhood almost always brings. In an essay that originally appeared in Family Circle magazine, the beloved American poet, the late Maya Angelou, described the birth of her first and only child, a son she named Guy. Listen to what she says. When I was 16, a boy in high school took interest in me, so I had sex with him just once. Then when I found out I was pregnant, I went to the boy and asked him for help, but he said it wasn't his baby and didn't want any part of it. I was scared to pieces. Back then, if you had money, there were some girls who got abortions, but I couldn't deal with that idea. Oh, no. I knew there was somebody inside me, so I decided to keep the baby. After I tried to hide my pregnancy from my mother, I'll never forget what she asked. Now, tell me this. Do you love the boy? I said, no. Does he love you? I said, no. Then there's no point in ruining three lives. We're going to have our baby. She was very loving, very accepting, not one minute of recrimination, and I never felt any shame. I'm telling you, she writes, that the best decision I ever made was keeping that baby. Yes, absolutely. Guy was a delight from the start, so good, so bright. I can't imagine my life without him. At 17, she says, I got a job as a cook and later as a nightclub waitress. My mother said to me, remember this, you can always come home. She kept that door open, and every time life kicked me in the belly, I would go home for a few weeks. I struggled, sure. We lived hand to mouth, but it was really heart to hand. Guy had love and laughter and a lot of good reading and poetry as a child. Listen to what she said. Having my son brought out the best in me and enlarged my life. Whatever he missed, he himself is a great father today. Years later, when I was married, I wanted to have more children, but I couldn't conceive. Isn't it wonderful that I had a child? At 16, praise God. All moms have that defining moment when they have to say yes to even begin the wild and unknown adventure that being a mother always brings. And for all moms who chose life in spite of hardships and hazards and hassles, we say thank you. A rare story from Jesus' childhood is a not-so-great mom moment for Mary. There's only one story recorded in the biblical biographies of Jesus about his childhood, but it is a very enlightening one. Jesus was 12 years old, and he went with his parents at, uh, to worship at the temple in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Take a look at this map. They lived in Nazareth. They go to Jerusalem, and that's the route that they would normally take. That's an annual trip of almost 100 miles from their home in Nazareth to Jerusalem. Uh, Usually they walked in large groups and it probably took them four to five days to cover that distance one way. On the return trip home, however, Mary and Joseph eventually noticed something was missing, Jesus. Now let me just say, there's some important rules all parents should be aware of, but right at the top of the list would be don't lose your kid. And if you've ever gotten separated from one of your children, even momentarily, you never forget it. And you have a hard time forgiving yourself. Mary and Joseph probably assumed that, she was, that he was with extended family members 
or with a close friend and his family. We're not told why neither of them had an exact location on Jesus. But we are told at the end of the first day on the return trip, when they set up camp, they discovered Jesus was not among them. The longer they searched, the more concerned they were. Mary and Joseph must have felt sick at their stomachs and deeply ashamed. They had one job. They'd been entrusted by God with raising the Messiah, and somehow they lost him. We left our oldest daughter at a restaurant once. I know. Can't believe my wife did that. Actually, it was my fault. It was my fault. We went to a Denny's in Lexington, Kentucky after church. We both drove separate cars. I went to pay the bill. Melinda took Rachel, walked behind me. Anna was talking to some people from our church back at the table, and Melinda said to me when she walked past, when I was paying the bill, get Anna. I thought she said, I got Anna. So I drove home. Melinda's in the driveway. She saw I did not have Anna. And she mouthed the words, where's Anna? And it was a home alone moment, you know, like, oh my gosh, we left Anna. So we drove back to the restaurant. It was only about a 10 minute uh, separation period and I picked her up, and that was so interesting. But I want to tell you something. After, after that time forward, I would say to Anna, when she acted up, I'm going to take you back to Denny's. <laughs> and this time, to this day, Anna hates Denny's. <laughs> Mary and Joseph anxiously retraced their steps back to Jerusalem. And it didn't take them 10 minutes to find him. It took three days. To say that panic was growing in Mary and Joseph's hearts would be an understatement. Luke describes the scene when they finally find him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and mother, or your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. The agony of Mary and Joseph contrasts sharply with the calm response of Jesus when they finally found him. Mary blurts out an accusation, perhaps tinged with that mixture of guilt and relief that most parents recognize Instead of saying, how could we have done this to you, leaving you behind like this? She says, how could you do this to us? But young Jesus accepts no blame and instead issues a gentle rebuke that speaks volumes. Mary said, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Jesus replied, that's funny because I've been right here doing my father's work. This was one of those moments when the reality of who Jesus really was, Israel's Messiah, The Son of God suddenly surfaced. But right after that revealing moment, we read this interesting phrase. Take a look. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus was obedient to Mary and Joseph. He knew who he was. He knew he had a special calling even beyond his parents' understanding. But as he matured physically, socially, spiritually, intellectually, as a child and teenager living in their home, he was obedient to and respectful of his parents. If I could throw in a little bonus material today, I would say to middle school and high school students in particular, it's nice to give your mother a card or to make her breakfast, or to take her out to eat this weekend. But I guarantee you what would mean more to her is for you to be mature enough to obey her basic instructions 365 days a year. When she says you can play video games for just a half hour, you don't stretch it to 45 minutes or an hour. When she says, I want you to pick up your room, you do it without complaint. When she says, could you give me a hand setting the table? You jump up immediately and help out. If she says, make sure you come straight home, you obey what she says. 
The teenage years are usually the most difficult for a mother to endure. It's a period when teens are asserting yourself more and more, and you're struggling for control. Your friends are disrespectful to their parents, and it's a cool thing to rebel. As a teenager, you're encouraged to question authority and insist on your independence. Someone said this, adolescence is nature's way of preparing parents to welcome the empty nest. Amen. But when you obey, listen, when you obey, you bring honor to your mother, and more importantly, you bring glory to God. We read about another great mom moment in the Gospel of John. The second chapter of the Gospel of John begins by saying, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Let me just pause and ask you, can you picture Jesus at a wedding? Have you ever thought about Jesus telling a joke or laughing out loud at a wedding reception? Or maybe he puts his arm around the groom's shoulder and gives him a little word of advice or gives him a bit of teasing, or perhaps he gives the bride a warm embrace. Or how about Jesus doing the traditional Jewish line dancing? Da, 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 da. Can you picture that? Christians have long portrayed Jesus as being a very somber person. And there is a verse in the Bible that says he was a man of sorrows familiar with suffering. But the scripture writers also tell us that in the last hours before his death, Jesus said to his disciples, my joy, I leave with you. This is a man going to the cross. Jesus at his core was a joyous person. I think he would have been very comfortable at a wedding reception. I have performed and participated in several weddings and I can testify that things can and do go wrong at weddings and something terribly went wrong at this wedding in Cana of Galilee. Something not at the ceremony, but at the reception, the host family ran out of wine. For a Jewish feast, wine was considered an essential. Without wine, said the rabbis, there is no joy. And it's not that the people in first century Judaism were a bunch of drunkards. In fact, drunkenness was considered a great disgrace, so much so that they actually drank their wine in a mixture composed of two parts wine to three parts water. But however weakened it might have been, keeping the wine flowing was considered a necessity at Jewish feast, and failure to do so would have been a major source of embarrassment. In those days, it was often difficult to tell how many people were going to attend a wedding feast, or for that matter, how long they were going to stay. These people were poor, but they were proud, and they would work for years to be able to provide enough food and drink for a week-long wedding celebration. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was sympathetic with the families of the bride and groom. This was an awkward social situation that could have lasting negative repercussions for these families for years to come. Most likely, one or both sets of parents were good friends of Mary's, and some scholars have even suggested that Mary was acting as a kind of a wedding coordinator. That's why she knows what's happening behind the scenes. And so she finds Jesus and she says, they have no more wine. That was not an announcement, you understand. That was a not so subtle request. And every mother listening or watching knows what I'm talking about. When my wife used to say to one of our daughters, the dishwasher has been run or there are clothes in the dryer she was not just informing them of the location of those items. <laughs> she was making an indirect request for assistance. So when Jesus' mother said they're out of wine, she was soliciting help, not just stating facts. Jesus understood this, and he replied, Dear woman, why do you involve me? Leon Morris, in his New International Commentary, says the word woman does not come across as cold in the Greek as it does in the English. And boy, that's good to know, because if I said to my mother, woman, why are you involving me? Somebody's going to need some wine. <laughs> By the way, Jesus uses this term for Mary again in his last moments as he hangs on the cross and tenderly commits Mary to the care of John 
one of his beloved apostles. He says, woman, behold your son. This really is a term of affection. Yet Leon Morris says, we must bear in mind that it is most unusual to find it when a son addresses his mother that Jesus calls Mary woman and not mother probably indicates that there's a new relationship between them as he enters the public phase of his ministry. Jesus, perhaps for the first time, is affirming his independence from his mother by saying, my time has not yet Come. He was gently stating that he wasn't bound by her wishes anymore. Her agenda wasn't necessarily his agenda. It's a not so subtle way of him saying to his mom, dear lady, there's someone else I must please first. But then Mary immediately does two things that only a mother can do. First, she seemingly ignores him and turns right around and says to the household servants, do whatever he tells you. It's as though Jesus' mother pretended that exchange never happened and went right on with her agenda. And she turned to the servants and she said, you just do what he says. And remarkably, Jesus responds with his first miracle, turning water into wine. What's really going on in this story? Well, it's hard to translate the exact meaning of those words into English, but the fact of the matter is Mary clearly understood Jesus was able to help even if she didn't know how he would help. She also is openly saying, as only a mother can, my boy can do anything if he wants to. You just be ready to do what he tells you. But she clearly recognized Jesus was in control here, not her. He would act on his own timetable. That's why he said, my time has not yet come, meaning I understand the situation, mother, and I will help when the time is right. She wasn't telling him what to do or how to do it. She merely readied the servants to act on Jesus' instructions whenever he was ready. And when, I think when you understand those words in that light, These are some of the greatest words of faith in the Gospels. Let's read them out loud together. Read them with me. Do whatever he tells you. Even when Mary did not understand what Jesus was going to do. Even when it seemed at first he had refused her request. Mary still believed in him so much that she prepared the people around her to do whatever Jesus instructed. Because you see, Mary had the faith which could trust even when it did not understand. And I want to tell you, that's one of the greatest moments in any mom's life, to surrender and prepare yourself to do God's will, regardless of what it may be. There is an often overlooked, not so great mom moment for Mary that the gospel writer Mark tells us about. Then Jesus entered the house, and again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. Jesus' popularity was beginning to snowball. Rumors circulated. Maybe he was the long-awaited Messiah. Everyone's buzzing about Jesus. But when his family heard about what was taking place, they were not delighted. They were disturbed. It's sometimes hard for family and friends to accept that someone close to them has a special calling from God on their life. Remember when Jesus first returned to his hometown of Nazareth and he began teaching the people in their synagogue and they were amazed. Matthew says, where did this, here's what the the, the people there said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this, this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. If it was hard in his hometown to be honored. It was especially hard in his own household. Jesus' own brothers were skeptical and perhaps even offended by the inference that he was the Messiah. I mean, listen to me. After all, what would it take you, what would it take to convince you that your brother was the son of God? So they came, a lot, right? So they came to take charge of him for they thought, He must be out of his mind. I like how the message paraphrases this. They suspected he was getting carried away with himself. 
and they brought Mary with them. They must have persuaded her that Jesus' life was in danger because she went along with this misguided intervention. Maybe in her mom's mind, she's thinking, Jesus is probably not taking time to rest or eat properly. He needs to come home for a break and let me cook him a good home-cooked meal. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus could have publicly humiliated his mother here. He could have said, hold on a minute, Mom. Do you remember how you got pregnant with me? Didn't you say an angel visited you? How many times did you whisper in my ear when I was growing up that I was the chosen one of God? Mom, you remember what happened at the wedding in Cana? How can you now question what I'm doing? But he didn't. Instead, he calmly stood his ground and affirmed his mission that through him, God was forming a new family, a family that would not be based on their biological blood, but on his sacrificial blood, a family that would not be formed by earthly processes, but by heavenly promises, a family that is based not on being born, but based on being born again. Can I just say, honestly, there will be times when your mother gets things wrong. When we're young, we tend to idolize our parents and think they can do no wrong. But there always comes a day when we discover that our parents make mistakes just like everybody else. They're not perfect parents. They're not perfect mates. And they're certainly not perfect Christians. Often we go to the opposite extreme in our teen and young adult years and see them as total bunglers. Or we ridicule and resent them. Would you listen to me? Maturity is when you can forgive your parents because they are fallible, but you can still appreciate that they're valuable to your life and well-being. Don't be bitter against your mother all your life and blame all your problems on her. Forgive her. But don't allow her ongoing misguided influence to divert you from walking in obedience to God either. There may be times when you have to admit your mom is just wrong. Maybe she does not share your Christian values. Maybe she criticizes you for being baptized or changing churches or giving away so much money or the way you raise your children or the fact that you stay with your spouse that she frankly can't stand. She thinks you're out of your mind. Jesus sets a positive example for how we should respond in that kind of circumstance. Don't let your mother's wrong opinions prevent you from doing what you know is right, but be tolerant and patient as possible, knowing in the end, truth always prevails. The most heartbreaking, not so great moment for Mary is also recorded in John's gospel, and it says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. Everything Mary feared would happen to Jesus did. How crushed she must have been as she stood at the foot of the cross to see her son writhing in pain and not be able to comfort him, to hear his enemies taunt him and gloat over his dying breaths and not be able to silence them. Mary was there because that's what moms do. They show up when everybody else runs out. I find it revealing that no words from Mary were recorded at the cross. What would one say? Mary had graciously stepped aside three years earlier at a wedding when Jesus had said, my time has not yet come. She didn't question. She didn't argue. She didn't storm off. She knew their relationship had changed. The child she had delivered was stepping into his role as her deliverer. And at the cross, though her pain was great and her confusion was greater, by her silent vigil in his final, in his final breaths, she was once again consenting to God's will for her beloved firstborn son and for her own hopes as a mom. And the biblical record of Mary would have a sad ending if that were the last that we read of her. But there is one 
final really great mom moment for Mary. And we read about it in the book of Acts. Following the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus, we read these vindicating words. They all join together constantly in prayer with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Mary had watched Jesus die, but three days later, she saw the empty tomb. And 40 days later, she's worshiping and waiting in Jerusalem for the promised gift of the Spirit that Jesus said would flow through his disciples like a stream of fresh running water. And I like to think this, that when people ask her during that interim period between the ascension of Jesus and the coming of the Spirit, what should we do? That she probably said, do whatever he tells you. Mary saw a baby be born without the seed of a man. Mary saw that boy become a man. Mary saw that man turn water into wine and one who refused to yield to her agenda in spite of her whining. And Mary saw death turn to victory. She witnessed his first miracle at a wedding and she witnessed his final miracle at a graveyard. The first miracle caused a stir. The last miracle created a story that will never be silenced. The first miracle created wonder. The last miracle caused worship. The first miracle brought people to their feet. The last miracle brought people to their knees. The first miracle launched a ministry. The last miracle led to a movement of a growing community of people on a life-changing journey with Jesus where everybody's welcome and nobody's perfect. But through Jesus, anything is possible. Stand with me right now. Let's stand together. Lake County, stand with me right now. So, Father, I thank you so much for the honesty of the Scriptures that you have revealed to us because we need to see it, the great and the not-so-great moments of parenting and of Mary. There are times when We feel like as moms or dads, we got it right. And there are times we know we got it wrong. But I thank you, Father, that Mary comes back and she teaches us. Even when we don't understand, even when we're confused, even when it's hard to trust, that she says, do whatever he tells you. I just pray right now, Lord, that anybody that you're speaking to, that they'll do whatever you tell them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love that. It's one of the greatest statements of faith in all the scripture. Do whatever he tells you. I have no doubt God's telling some of you to do something. And I'd love to know about it. We'd love to know about it as our pastoral staff here. You can go to Next Steps, Journey Christian dot com next steps tell us about that step you're ready to take that you're ready to do whatever jesus tells you to do for some of you and we saw it at 9 30 once again a lady gave her life to jesus and she was baptized into christ a mom baptized into christ maybe there's a mom maybe there's a, a single adult maybe there's a dad today i encourage you do whatever he tells you to do. And if it's to profess your faith in him and be baptized, the door's open. Just go right now and do it.
Mother's Day. The most famous mother in history is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Can you imagine Mary's first communion? How excruciatingly painful that must have been for her. What must that have been like for her to reflect on the body and the blood of her son, Jesus? As she prepared to eat the bread and drink the juice, her thoughts must have been more vivid, personal, and emotional than any you and I have ever had about communion. Think about this, the one to whom Mary gave life became the one who gave new life to her. Talk about a defining moment. So each week, like Mary, we remember our new life in Christ. Jesus said, I've come in order that you might have new life, life in all of its fullness. So together, let's pray and then celebrate communion together. Father, we are so grateful for Jesus and all that he has done and that we have the defining moment in our lives where we gave our life to him and he gave us new life in return. We celebrate that right now, Lord. We thank you for this piece of bread, this cup of juice that remind us so much of how much you love us and so much of what you've done for us. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen. Let's take the bread. And let's take the juice. Once again, happy Mother's Day to all of you who are joining us online. Don't forget, uh, we have a gift for mothers and you can simply go to the link on your screen. Or if you're in one of our chats, feel free to click on the link that'll be posted in the chat and that'll take you to uh, our website where you can request a gift uh, for yourself if you're a mother or if you'd like to give a gift to your mother, you can do that as well. And so we appreciate all of you who have joined us again today. Um, in just a few moments, there'll be some questions that come up on the screen that will generate some good discussion for you, your family, those who are with you. So take the opportunity uh, to dive a little deeper, uh, use those questions as a way of doing that, and you will certainly be blessed. Again, next week, we continue our Defining Moments series, teaching series, and with a focus on baptism. So be sure next week to join us, invite your family and your friends, you'll be blessed. And never forget that through Jesus, anything is possible.